Imagine if you were unexpectedly in a tragic car accident. You were thrown out of your body. Your body's broken. You're hovering around watching the scene going on. And someone shows up who can see you. That's the life of Sarah Grace. She's a psychic, paramedic, and so much more. And we're going to be talking to her today about her journey and what the ways all of us exit our lives and bodies and how we enter as well. Hi, Sarah. It's so good to see you again. Hi, Regina. Thank you for having me. So I saw you at Gaia. We had our first uh, formal chat on camera at Gaia, which comes out in a few months. And then it turns out you were staying just down the road. So we got together and I got to see what you do now with the rest of your life, which is just amazing, amazing energy work, really very different than what most people do. But how you got here is unbelievable. Yeah, it's been a <laughs> ride. Yes, <laughs> is unbelievable. So let's. What I'd like to do is just start a little bit at the beginning, so people can understand what gave you the grist you have. You came into life psychic, and we're seeing the world wide open by the age of seven, right? Correct. So I was raised in South Dakota in a tiny little town of two thousand, pre-internet. So there was no way for me to just Google or like look up, you know, what was going on as my psychic abilities came on. So I was just a little kid doing my thing, uh, cruising around on my bike and hanging out with my friends, just wanting to be, you know, a normal kid like anybody. Went to bed one day at the age of seven and I woke up and I was able to first, it began for me with auric fields so I could see color around people. And I was like, all right, well, whatever. I guess this is just what it is. But over the next couple of weeks, um, I kept having more intense experiences. So being able to feel other people's feelings, sense their thoughts and intentions, I could start to see kind of disease and blocks uh, of energy in people's bodies. And then it let it eventually went to seeing spirit Um and deceased, you know, humans, uh, dead people. And so just as being a kid, you know, I was confused and I felt really expanded, kind of dizzy. I had a lot of ringing in my ears and, and I didn't understand what was going on, but I just assumed that this was how it was for everybody. So unfortunately, I had a volatile home life, not a lot of stability or safety there. So I was hesitant to say anything. But when I finally was like, it didn't go away. You know, I thought it would eventually just go away, but the stimulus didn't go away. So when I asked people in my family, what's this about? Unfortunately, I got the shaming, the kind of the hellfire and brimstone and don't ever talk about this or we'll send you to a loony bin. And of course, nobody wants to hear those words, especially when, you know, you're just a kid. So I developed a sense of toxic shame and I really like clamped down at that time. And I thought there was something really wrong with me mentally, which really frightened me, you know, Um, and that kind of kicked off my journey into uh, all that that came down the road as a result of having that fear of being this way and not understanding and not being able to control uh, the amount of stimulus that I was dealing with and navigating. And you must have taken the opportunity now and then, until you were ashamed so much you stopped, of of sharing with people some of what you were seeing. As a little kid, um, yeah, I talked to, you know, a couple of friends, just little friends that I had about it. But when they couldn't see what I was seeing, that kind of confirmed that I was different somehow. And it actually added to my fear as opposed to, you know, placating me in any way. No, that's understandable. So your your mom, um, it, it, we won't go into it. They can read your book, Journey into Grace, and find out what your background was like. Uh, it, it was pretty horrific, really. I mean, yes. yeah very cruel mother. And um, so you found ways to deal with it. And you found a way ultimately, and we're just cutting right through to the chase, you found a way to ultimately stop the visions. Even when you went to college, you said you couldn't go to the lunchroom because you could see everybody's stuff, the beings around them, the noises were crushing, the colors and sounds and lights. It was driving you crazy to be in groups of people because you were seeing all of their stuff at the same time. Just tell us a little bit about what that what that feels like oh it's so overwhelming to the system and 
So if you've ever gone to like, just go to Target or Best Buy or whatever, you go back to the back of the store, you know, they got that whole wall of TVs with all the screens. And so if they're all playing, they're playing the same thing usually in a store. But just imagine you're standing and every one of those screens is coming at you with different information. And you're trying to focus on one screen right in front of you. Well, that was my experience um, because I was trying very hard to focus on life in the tangible reality and what was happening to me while being bombarded by all of this other stimulus constantly. So my nervous system, it was just like holding onto a charged wire and being electrocuted, you know, not a fun experience, not not fun. I had a very difficult time grounding, I would be lethargic, I'd have a lot of like confusion and mood swings, because there was just so much data coming through my system. And I wasn't aware at the time how to ground and self regulate with that. Well, you ultimately found a way to self-regulate <laughs> and your book goes, you you don't hold anything back in your book. You tell what the journey was like and and it's very brave of you. Uh, a lot of courage to do that. Uh, I've interviewed other people who had rough childhoods who ended up blasted wide open as well. And you share what that journey is like in a much richer way than people normally do because it's uncomfortable. So yeah. you ultimately found what truck drivers find when they have long hauls. You found a <laughs> And finally, you got to turn all the voices off. Tell us what happened when you started on that path. Well, for me, uh, as a result of the instability and violence that I grew up with, I didn't have a sense of safety, belonging, or security. And then you add the high velocity stimulus, and I was just kind of floating, you know. So after my mom died and I went into college at an early age, I really just went off the rails uh, with drugs and alcohol. And I was trying to compensate. I was trying to cope and formulate some sort of safety or personal power or some sort of something. And so I developed several addictions, but I figured out and found out that um, like anything speedy with like the ephedrine or those types of powders would actually begin to anesthetize and bring the stimulus down. In my life, that's what I've noticed is anything like that would be a depressant or an alcohol or anything like that would exacerbate the um, stimulus. And uh, any speedy substances would actually begin to bring the stimulus down. And we can look at our pharmacological, you know, modalities treating ADHD and those types of things with Adderall. It makes sense. Yes. So biochemically and neurochemically that it helps to kind of um, reduce some of that stimulus and, and help. But it wasn't conducive to health. <laughs> it wasn't, <laughs> you know, <laughs> no, not the way I was doing it. Definitely yeah, looking up in some places you regretted later. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And so I was young and I was in a really volatile and unstable space in my life. And so I was using drugs and accelerants uh, to cope. Uh, but ultimately, it, it, it bur I got burned by it, you know, when I had an overdose. And that kind of took me into the next leg of my journey. Well, we'll talk about that because it was actually introduced when you were younger, because one of the things you did, you talked about, you liked anything speedy. Part of that was running. I mean, you had discipline, you did your academic work, you turned into a long distance runner. I mean, you, you had, you had a strength of character underneath it all. And you had discipline underneath it all. Thank God. Thank God. Uh, that really, really saved you. So you were running and such, but there was a day where you, you fell, you tripped and you fell. And you, you see, now one thing about the Dakotas, you were raised on um, Lakota land. Mm -hmm. Standing Rock. Yeah. And, uh, tribal reservation. Mm -hmm. Right. And so it wouldn't be a surprise to us to learn what kind of being showed up, magnificent being showed up when you were at a really low point on the ground, punching at the world and punching at your guides and life in general, you were so done. Tell us about this being. So this goes back to when I was still in South Dakota prior to college. Mm -hmm. And I was probably 14 ish when this one happened. And so I'd been navigating this high velocity stimulus that I didn't want and I didn't want anything to do with for a long time secretly by myself and navigating that plus chaos and, and violence and trying to fight for my physical safety in life every day. I was just like, it was a lot. 
And one day, so I would go running. Thank goodness somebody invited me to go try out for cross country. And the first time I ran a long distance, I got the endorphin high. And I was like, oh, yes, this is, <laughs> I can do this, you know. Plus, I, I didn't understand at the time that the rhythmic cadence of my breath and the my feet hitting the ground was actually helping to ground my energy and teach me how to channel and manage some of the stimulus. But one particular day that you're referencing, I had just had it, big fight in the house. I go flying out of my house to go for a run. And I was down by, on a dirt road, kind of down by the river. And uh, a, a, the spirit of a young Native American girl appeared. And I was just not having it. You know, I was just not in the mood like, at all. And so I actually started yelling at her and picked up some rocks and just chucked it over there. But of course, she doesn't have a body. So she's just looking at me like, <laughs> whatever. And then I just started booking it down the road, you know, and I was so mad and overwhelmed and frustrated. And then I caught my toe on a rock and just tripped and just went, you know, end over end, skidding across, getting all the gravel like embedded. And I just laid there in the dirt, you know, like, uh. And all of a sudden I heard this, or I felt rather, this really powerful presence. And if you've ever had any sort of spiritual experience or religious experience, or if you've witnessed death, um, it, it's almost like this reverence. Sometimes you can have these pinnacle experiences in those, uh, you know, types that you can just sense the power and the greatness Um that that's beyond this reality. And so I had this sense of this divine power behind me and all of the colors started to illuminate uh, around me. And it was like, again, like being charged, plugged into a little outlet and everything started to like come alive. And I turned around and there was the spirit of a Native American Lakota um, chief, Indian chief. And he was massive and he was on a horseback and he had a staff and the full plume of headdress. And I felt like the biggest schmuck, you know, laying there in the dirt, you know, I was like, oh, crap, like, you know, did I do something wrong by throwing rocks at her? Like, what, you know, and he didn't verbally say anything. It was telepathic, but it was very much kind of a recognition, like, we understand this is hard, you know, and keep going. There was, it was more eloquent and specific, but it was along that line. And then just like that, it was like he, everything expanded and then contracted and just went back to, to baseline. And I was laying there in the dirt again. And that was powerful to me because, you know, that was one of my many low points and I would oftentimes have guides come in at my low points to kind of give me these tiny little, you know, direction pointers or a little bit of inspiration. And he, throughout my life still to this day, I've only seen him a handful of times and he only comes in when I'm in extremis. So very, very powerful guide for me. Yeah. I mean, the way you describe in the book, it just there was a splendor about him. And he did come in also when you nearly died mm -hmm. uh, in an overdose. And and just not to do too much of a spoiler alert, but your your mother would actually try to kill you. Mm -hmm. I mean, try to smother you while you're sleeping, you know, put acetone in your contact lens case and try to blind you. And I mean, really, she was very, very dark and disturbed. Mm -hmm. And so this is what you grew up with and were contending with. And so it's no surprise you had many low points, but ultimately there was a breakthrough. Ultimately, you heard after going through, you became successful as a, an assistant to a, was she a, a producer? She was a casting director. Casting director, yeah. And you became successful at that because you're spunky, you're cute, you you knew your way around the world, you were intuitive, and you became, uh, you rose up and you were very useful. Um, but in the end, something, again, kept saying, no, this isn't it yet. And you would see her in ambulance go by. Mm -hmm. So it. after after college and kind of my wild child days there, I left and went to Florida and I found my way into the casting world. And that was beautiful. It was a beautiful segue. I did a lot of modeling. I did a lot of, of things. 
And I could, the superficiality of it, I could, because again, being able to see everybody's, you know, what they're not saying and what, what they're actually up to, I can see it just like I can see the color of the shirt they're wearing. So the, it was cognitive dissonance for me and it, I could just, my soul felt vapid. It just, I felt like I was thirsting for something deeper and eventually made my way out to California. And every time an ambulance would go by, I would just get this knowing like that, you should do that. And I was so scared of it, though, because being a paramedic is no joke. You know, it's literal life and death. And you can, if you mess up, you can kill somebody. It's a big deal. You I didn't, you had such an edgy life. You had so much courage and kind of grit, you know, and strength that you had developed. I mean, in a sense, you're a tiny little thing. You're what, five one or something? Five one. Small but mighty. <laughs> but, I'd, get, I'd get out of the ambulance and everybody be like what is she doing <laughs> but talk about that going into it and and what it was like for you to ultimately go, not just go through the training and pass you know but what happened when you start opening up again it was such a different world. I had never experienced uh, the militaristic type environment. And so the firefighters, paramedics, SWAT, uh, and a lot of law enforcement, we all are kind of training in the same curriculum. But obviously, the paramedics are the medical side. But it's a very intense training. Um, and there's a lot of weeding out. Uh, because think about it. We It's literally, again, life or death, these extreme circumstances that we're, we're being called to come in at people's worst moments. And so it takes a certain personality type. And it's just not for everybody, obviously, right? We're, we're the people that run towards what everybody, all the normal people are running away from. So, you know, there's something unique about us. But I think that there we're type A. We uh, tend to be typically quite like alpha or masculine, very independent thinkers, very autonomous, and we can handle a tremendous level of intensity and potency. So my upbringing, uh, not being safe and having to kind of fend for myself most of my life actually prepped me perfectly for the 911 system because it felt like I felt like a duck to water when I eventually got trained in and through I went through the UCLA EMT program and initially I was scared but then I just kind of made a decision like you know what no like I got some pushback from some of the, the guys and I was like you know what no like I'm, I can do this. And so I just made up my mind and went through the program. And then I got my first assignment. I got assigned to uh, training on an ambulance down in South Central Los Angeles. So we covered Compton, Inglewood, Hawthorne, Carson, and sometimes Watts, depending on the system. So it was extraordinarily busy system. And that's where it's I very first started. Very, very stressful in terms of um, violence violence intensity and just sheer call volume you know because it was just relentless there was no breaks no stopping no sleep for 24 hours you're just on and you're moving of all the places in the world you could have been <laughs> <laughs> i know from south dakota like to, to <laughs> south central I'm like hi <laughs> little, little girl who sees colors and dead people i'm like hi <laughs> Um, so, so let's talk about then when you so your your faculties really started opening up while you were on the job and hop right into that part of your life. Cool. So again, at this stage in my life, the energetic sensitivities were still nothing I wanted a part of. I was aware of them because once I got cleaned up, so I had gone through overdose, all that stuff, but eventually I cleaned myself up after hitting rock bottom. And so uh, the stimu stimulus came back, but I was just doing my best to ignore it. So once I got on the calls, what I had noticed was the energies just started working through me. So everything for me on a 911 call would be very matrix-like. Everything would slow down the second we would be arriving and I would begin to expand. My energy would expand. If death, if I was going on a death call, which I did a lot of, I would taste metal. That was my tell. And I would know two or three steps ahead what was going to happen. So I was getting a precognitive um, kind of data stream, if you will, an awareness that gave me a little bit of an edge. But at first, I didn't know anything about it. And I didn't want anything to do with it. I was just trying to be good at my job and be able to, you know, so I would come on scene, and I would be able to feel one of my first actually, it was my first CPR was very traumatic to me, because 
I had, we'd already done a full day and I was just trying to sleep a couple hours before going home. We got called in the middle of the night, you know, three, four o'clock in the morning, whatever. And it was the CPR. And all I remember was walking in and seeing the little girl and the dad in the corner and their eyes just locked onto my eyes. And I felt all of their energy and all of their terror come in. Mom and dad, cardiac arrest, heart attack or stroke or whatever she had. And she went down. And so then starting to do CPR. So I was navigating the tremendous emotions of people on scene, plus the pressure of having to perform and do my very first CPR. Um, it was so overwhelming and overstimulating to me. That was kind of a big test for me because I was like, yeah, I can't do this. This is too much. But um, I took a couple of days off and I did a lot of thought and kind of run. I, I went for a trail run and was kind of asking, you know, for a sign uh, to keep going and I received that sign. And so I was like, okay, you know, I'm in this. And so ultimately I was hugely closeted, wouldn't say anything about it, but I gently started to notice that it was coming in handy, like that it was being useful. It wasn't this energy, this, you know, the stimulus, the, the, the visions or auditory, like sometimes I would just get an auditory, you know, give this medication or do this. And so I would just have these knowings. And so I started to gently relax my fear of it, but I still wasn't willing to say anything about it out loud to the firefighters and SWAT guys, you know? Because you didn't want to be, again, isolated and thought of as different. So did it come in handy to the extent where you'd come upon a, a crash where there are multiple victims, for example, and you could see someone standing outside of their body, and we're going to talk about who they're surrounded by in these circumstances, and you could see they were they were leaving the body versus someone else who was hovering and could reconnect. Did Were you able to help in that way know where to focus your energy or there were there kind of other parameters? Yes. So as a paramedic, we have very specific protocols that we have to follow, especially when it comes to CPR and declaration of death, when it comes to leaving bodies, you know, we can't leave a body on the freeway, for instance. Um, But if there was multiple, I would have the knowing of who was already transitioned. So because I would see, imagine, so when a soul exits in a trauma, oftentimes they're standing there confused next to the body. So the body could be crumpled on the ground from a drive-by shooting, or it could be in a car trapped and pinned or a fall and at the bottom of a canyon and they're confused. So I would see the soul that looked just like the body, except it was translucent. I could see through it. And then telepathically, they could see that I could see them. And I don't know exactly why that is. I think it's the same as like how spirits know that mediums, right can channel and so they would be able to tell that i could see them and so over time i developed my own little protocol and this was quiet i never said anything out loud but i would start communicating with the soul telepathically you're dead you left your body you're in a car accident we're going to do cpr we're going to cut you out the car and take you to the hospital blah, 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 to start to give them a sense of understanding of what was happening and going on and so yeah, it became a skill set over time, but initially I was very clumsy with it and still kind of scared, not understanding why I could see these things and then not knowing what to do with it, you know, because that's a whole lot of information to watch somebody die physically, but then to help have to communicate with their spirit about that death. It was a lot for my little human brain to, to handle. Sure. You know? I hope you're enjoying this video because if you are, there are dozens more like it on my site, all supported by people like you. So if you'd like to keep this work rolling in and join our community, just click on the Patreon button at reginameredith.com. That also gives you access to insider commentary, my live book club, and other live events with special guests. So join in. Thanks. So let's talk about what happens and we'll talk about different kinds. You went on many different calls. Some were a CPR type call where an older person's had a heart attack. Others were violent and quick. In the case when it's violent and quick like that, like a car accident or a a gunshot wound and or something, um, what does, what 
is the scene normally like on a spiritual level? Well, oftentimes trauma calls are intense, obviously. If there's, you know, bystanders, we have to secure the scene and handle the family. We got to secure the freeway or whatever it is that we're navigating and dealing with. So it's a high velocity, high octane scene in the physical reality. On the energetic plane, what I noticed in traumas was there was almost always an angel that came, a celestial being. And I believe that the reason was to help the soul begin to understand and come to terms with. So if you can imagine, if you've ever seen a car accident and driven by and looked at it, or, you know, we've seen tons of just our media and what's out there right now, there's just so much death and violence. So there's just imagine all of the, the chaos. And then there would all of a sudden, it would start like fireflies, it would start with this like little light, and then it would begin to take form and expand. And it would just be a magnif- magnificent calm energy. And the angels that I saw, I never saw like wings. It was more just um, violet, cobalt, silver, white, light, ominous, just beautiful, calm, tranquil, and just love. And so they would come and then the soul who had just, the person who had just died, they would have a moment and eventually envelop and then I would watch them disappear so I know the person had crossed that's I mean I think that should give comfort to people um to understand when this when they see a car crash because it's so shocking to our senses when you see a mangled car and the ambulance and people being taken away to understand that there is a grace in this transition doesn't matter how it happens in life Mm -hmm. so let's talk about a transition where you've uh, you wrote about uh, several of these different um experiences in your book where you go to a cpr type of call um someone is having a heart attack Um, maybe it's someone who has a partner there with them, but let's talk about what the energy looks like when they're having a more peaceful transition, so to speak. So if it's a medical death or like a hospice, a cancer or end stage disease process, um, you know, still, it's still kind of a shock and a jar, like a little bit of a jar to the family, even though they may know, you know, because it's such a death is such a huge thing to get the mind around. And if you're not somebody who's familiar and see it every day, it, it's a thing, especially if it's a, a loved one, right? But the the medical death differed in terms of energetics in the way that the person may have been in bed for a while and their auric field would expand over the course of days or even weeks. And we hear a lot about this now in the near-death experience community, people talking about expanding out of their body and going to the you know ceiling and looking down or astral traveling to see their loved ones. We hear a lot about that. So the auric field expands and the veil thins. And then what I noticed at the moments of death, and I had the exquisite, I think it was an exquisite honor um, of being present, probably 20 to 30 um, active deaths and watching somebody looking them in the eyes as they're taking their last breath to me was became almost like midwifing. It was such an exquisite experience to share. But I would notice that the, okay, they'd have agonal respirations, so their respiratory drive would kick out, then the heartbeat starts to slow. Once the heartbeat stops, the chakras begin to release and unfurl at the base, at the root chakra, and it looks like ribbons unfurling. It was so cool. Sometimes it was really slow, sometimes it was really fast, but it was always like ornately. It's it's just, there's some exquisite divine wisdom to it. And so the chakras would unfurl and the soul would go out the crown. And that's what I understood the light at the end of the tunnel to be, is us like exiting our body. And then I would see like a little, it would almost be like a little puff of smoke coming out of the top of the head that was the soul before the soul would take form of what the person looked like. And sometimes people, uh, if it was like an acute heart attack or stroke, um, it wasn't super traumatic, but it was more unexpected. So they had a lot more vitality. So that stream that would come out the head would be more vibrant and robust versus somebody end stage battling you know, cancer, renal failure, whatever they got going, and they're exhausted. It was just like a little 
tough. But I would always see deceased loved ones and pets come. And sometimes religious archetypes come to meet the the individual. And then it would be kind of a neat, it was like I was watching a reunion of sorts before then I would watch them transition. And what what about um, what happens? Oh, you were just talking about pets. I love it. Um, our little favorite doggies in our life or cats or whatnot. Um, but oftentimes you hear the story of people saying, but I've been sitting with my mother for weeks while she's been going through this process. I wanted to hold her hand when she died. But they wait till you go out for a snack and then they leave their bodies so, because you're not pulling on them. I wanted to know from your perspective what that's about. I always thought it was that they're trying to get out, but everyone's kind of holding them in, you know. I, what think, you- I think you're on to something with that, really, because a lot of times... Um, you know, there's people hold on until certain relatives come. We've heard a, a ton of these stories where it's yeah. like they've been hanging on for a long time and then somebody finally gets there and then boom. Um, so it could be about like a sense of guilt or obligation or like wanting to appease the person or making it okay for the person. Whereas like your death process is your own unique experience and it's yours right and so i think they're finally like oh, okay they're gone That's no. what I, <laughs> I can finally get out of here peacefully in peace without people crying and pulling on my energy field the other thing i wondered about is this because you you were in south central you saw some pretty ugly stuff um did you and, and you're talking about the beauty of death was there ever an instance where it wasn't so beautiful where someone is just overwhelmed with it other things, contending with things other than an angel. Um, Can you tell us what that might be like? Absolutely. So I saw a lot of, not a lot of, but several regretful suicides. Um, And I'll, so, and then I saw some darkness, but I personally never experienced like dark entities or energies greeting anybody in all the people that I transitioned. That's good to know. I saw I saw tons of entities and darkness attached to people that are alive, you know, and that's its own whole story about like addiction and the consciousness of a lot of those substances and how there's a lot that goes with that. So, you know, some people are really frightened to die because they're like, I don't want to go to a dark place. And I mean, all I can share is my experience, but I got a lot more experience in this arena than most people. You know, I saw a lot of it and I never once saw anything like dark and spooky come and like snatch a soul or anything like that. It was usually more, um, I, some of the suicides, like they were like, ah, what did I do? And I would see the regret and remorse. And one of the most challenging calls for me that I think that's when I needed to take a week off, uh, was a suicide that was, she was like grasping at her body, trying to get back in the whole way to the hospital, just trying to climb back in her body. And I was like, not gonna, not gonna happen. You know, it just, that was really hard. I've heard this from other people who are mediums Mm -hmm. and have said people oftentimes when it comes to suicide are like, geez, if I just known to call someone that if I just could see then what I can see now, which is people do love me and care, they just lose sight of it. And I think that's such an important lesson for the living. If one is feeling so desperate and disconnected to understand there's someone who loves you. Mm-hmm. You just have to remember that and find that and connect with that until you can love yourself. I mean, Absolutely. that's a very because right now a lot of young people are committing suicide. Oh, yes. We have yeah. a 400% increase in young females, 11 to 14. Yes. Uh, no words for that. Uh, so I just take these words to heart, you know, if, if you're, you have a child or someone and if you can work with them and help them uh, avoid that fate of having regret after they're out of the body, no one wants to go through that. So let's talk about the other side of it, because sometimes EMTs have to show up when someone's giving birth in a place like a bathroom at a gas station or where side of the road. Side of the road yep. <laughs> Talk about the soul and the birth process, because that's something I've never really interviewed anyone on before, watching the soul come and join the body. 
It's super, it's super cool. And so on the ambulance, I delivered three. So I had countless deaths, hundreds of, hundreds of dead bodies and many, many active transitions. I was fortunate to deliver three in my time. One was a healthy and two were born addicted to crack. And so that's just what, what it was when we were delivering. But the, um, the energy is significantly different in that, of course, you're going through, you know, mom's in pain, you got to deal like it's it's pretty easy to deliver a baby, you really just catch and they're kind of slippery. So you just kind of really make sure you don't yeah. drop them. But it's, there was a lot of pink energy in life, right? There's green, there's emeralds, there's golds, there's silvers, there's kind of that a similar um, almost angelic celestial kind of presence. Cause to me, uh, there's nothing more closer to God incarnate than a newborn because it's literally just came from the immaterial to the material. Right. Yeah. And it is such an incredible experience to, to witness. Um, so I, in my private practice, I do a lot of energy healing now, and I've had quite a few uh, pregnant women come. And this was fun because I could see it from a different standpoint where it wasn't emergent and I wasn't trying to have to like, you know, deal with delivery. But I could see that the the soul of the baby was hovering just above mother's tummy and then the little umbilical cord, the energetic umbilical cord connecting to the physical placenta and the actual fetus. And I would be able to start to get information of like, oh, it'll likely be a boy and he's probably going to be a lot to handle and like, you know, just, in, you know, whatever. And so that was actually really, really sweet um, to see things like, like that. Yeah. I love it. And that's, a, I mean, that's something I've always found fascinating. I used to just for relatives and my very close girlfriends, I would do massage on their feet as they were going into the birth process. And sometimes I would talk to the beings within a window of like a week to 10 days before they were born. Mm -hmm. And it was, and they would tell me things about their lives, who that, what they had come to do, their primary interests, which parent they were more attached with either karmically or historically and all that. And I just found it so beautiful to watch the years go by and see how many of them actually, what they said was going to happen, happen, how much, before we come in, how much is already written about the plan, the plan for our life? And I, I just, I love it. But I've never actually, I can feel it. And I burst into tears when the baby takes that first breath. Something in me just burst into tears each time. Is that when you would see the being kind of enter the body at what point did the being enter and come it was pretty it was pretty embodied um already but once it gets either well with me you'd be being pushed through the birth canal um yeah. i wasn't doing c-sections obviously yeah. um but either way once the the baby releases from the yeah. mother it the body fully like it kind of lodges down and in the baby though from what i've been able to see it's like a little ball of gold light it looks very different from a clairvoyant perspective or a medical intu uh, intuitive perspective. A newborn up until the age of one is very different from the standard construct of a child. Oh, yeah. well, just in it, they're just like a little ball of light, you know, it's just like pure consciousness. And it would, so in human, in, in adults, in adolescent children, a lot of the data runs vertically through the systems, especially the mental uh, plane energy runs very vertically through. And with the babies, it just kind of is like this spiral. It's just a ball of, of light and, and data. So sweet to see. But let's talk about the other side of it. Say if you have come in, you have a contract. I mean, I, I think what you were talking about a little moment ago, I think of it like you come in and your little body is going to be addicted to crack and you're born into a tough circumstance. Uh, there's a negotiation period you and I've talked about before, and it's often shows up under an acronym that we call SIDS. I call it the opt out. There's about a year contractually in terms of the uh, incarnation clause or agreement uh, that there's an opt out period. And that's what SIDS 
is from an energetic perspective. It's like the the soul incarnates into human form. They'll start their experience and then they're like, mm, not quite ready. And so they'll opt out. That's what I would see. So if you see a little baby coming in under those dire circumstances where the mom is addicted and the baby's coming into a little body that's going to have a lot of problems and it's neural wiring later on because of the addiction, does that, is it any different or is it all the same golden light? The same. It's all the same. I mean, they, I would see the tinge of whatever substance, you know, math, crack, uh, heroin, all those things have specific resonance and vibration and consciousness that goes with them. So, of course, we would see that. And then we would have to be worried about withdrawals and making sure that they had their breathing. They were able to breathe on their own. So there was a lot more in the mechanics of a, a birth like that. One of my, yeah, one of mine, this was her. 15th pregnancy and 10th birth all addicted whoa yeah. a whole different thing humanity is something it's <laughs> humanity is something well i really advocate uh yeah i really like advocate to a tough one you agreed to a tough one when you yep. in um, some of these little babies do all of us have our stuff that we've got that we're bringing Absolutely. with us, every one of us. So before we say goodbye, uh, this time around, first of all, I want to let people know you did, you took those skills and you started working one-on-one -on -one with people to help them start releasing some of these um, sticky, heavy, energetic attachments and patterns that we have in our bodies that cause us either mental, spiritual, emotional, or physical unwellness. So tell a little bit about what you do before we say goodbye, because this is where you're spending your energy now. And then I have one final thing to say about you that I just love. Cool. Thank you. So yes, I have developed, um, I have my own private practice and I do, we could say it's medical intuition, but I specialize in psychic surgery. So it's just a very powerful restorative uh, branch of energy healing. Uh, I'm now I call, so psychic paramedic turned holistic first responder. And what that means is I'm still very much a paramedic, but now it's more for the energetics and for the soul. So people can come with whatever their issue, if it's a medical issue and they've been to every single doctor, or if they're having a psychotic break or a psychosis or done too much ayahuasca or plant medicines, like whatever it is, spiritual emergencies, all, the whole gamut of it. Um, I, I can see and I specialize in, in addiction and PTSD and trauma, of course. Um, I specialize in all of those types of acute cases, as well as people that are just sensitive and don't know how to like navigate or want to step into there. So we'll do a very powerful energetic clearing and reset. And then I'll give you kind of your own curriculum or uh, treatment protocol so that you feel empowered in moving forward in your life. Then it's more of a partnership. You're not just waving a magic wand. You can help bust up some of the original energy patterns, but it's up to us to do the rest. And I want to say one thing I just love about you and I so appreciate it is that because of this skill set and the unusual nature of your background and what you've been doing all these years, you've been approached to do reality shows and we're even approached to do one with three times one's one <laughs> discovery. The big one. Yeah, the big one with the Kardashians even. And you looked at it and they said, well, we need you to tweak this. You're going to have to say this. You know, this is a little scripted. And you said, no, it, it's hard because you can kind of salivate over the numbers and say, oh, my God, would this be good for my career? But you said no every time because, you know, it wasn't who you are in integrity with what you're here to do. Yeah, for me, I really... With my life experience, I've been put through so many tests and challenges and to do my own healing process, I understand what it takes and I'm not about to make it circusy. Um, I work with people's most, you know, vulnerable um, spaces. And so uh, holding a, a very powerful container of integrity is profoundly important to me. And so there was one Discovery Channel show that sounded perfect because it was going to be a site like paramedics that saw paranormal things. I was so all about it until they're like, oh, make it dark and spooky and change. And I was like, yeah, I just can't. So to me, what it is, Regina, is I understand now that I'm here to bridge the mainstream with the energetic and holistic. Uh, 
And Pete, we as a populace and society, there's so many people that just feel really stuck and they don't know where to go. And they may not understand all of their, you know, healing options in the holistic world. Maybe they've heard of Reiki or they, but they're on so many meds and they're drinking, you know, a bottle of whatever at night. And there's so many things that, that humanity is working with now. So we can just make, break it down, right? take any fear and shame away, meet them where they are, provide very powerful restorative energy work. And the most important thing is helping them to ignite their own power. It's not about like, I'm, I've done my work for myself, but helping those people reignite within themselves and, uh, you know, grab a hold of their own personal power and their own prana and life force. That's what I'm all about, you know, because then it's like, you know, taking the candle in the dark and you start lighting and passing it. And eventually that consciousness begins to spread and we can really do some powerful um, work on the planet that way. I agree. And, you know, it doesn't mean that you're, potential for having some kind of show that reaches, you know, thousands or hundreds of thousands of people isn't there. It's just that it's got to be done with integrity. And I'd love to see that happen for you. Yeah, me too. Let's go. Yeah. Yay! <laughs> anyway, Sarah, you're just a delight, just such a beautiful giving being. And I'm so appreciative that you got through your youth, that you lived through it. So you could be here to tell the story. So the rest of us can see our energy blueprint uh, through your eyes. Very, very beautiful. Yeah. Can I tell people where to find me real quick? I was just going to ask you that. Where is the best place to find you? So all my, you can find me at sarahkgrace.com. It's Sarah with an H and then K grace got, uh, dot com and all the books and things are on there i've got some meditations but i just started a really sweet online group so if you are not sure if a session's for you or you're just kind of working with whatever it's a really sweet community online community of other like-minded people that are energetically sensitive and all wanting to become empowered so that's called the grace place you can find that on love it Love it. Grace Place. Well, until next time, Sarah, thank you so much for taking the time to be with us today. I really appreciate your spirit. Thank you. Bye, everybody. So again, everyone, you can find Sarah at Sarah with an H, kgrace.com. And it sounds like a lovely group. If you're super sensitive and you don't know how to really run those energies, it sounds like you can get some real support there. Until next time, thank you for joining us here on reginameredith.com. If you enjoyed this video, be sure to subscribe to my YouTube channel, and you might also want to consider joining Patreon, which allows me to keep all of this content free and available to everyone. And if you're looking for like-minded souls, you might also enjoy my online community called Our Neighborhood. Links to join are in the description.